In this video, we'll discuss classical concerto form. Classical concerto form, so that of the mid to late 18th century, blends aspects from two other forms. The first is the Baroque concerto, and from the Baroque concerto, the classical concerto pulls the idea of alternating ritornello sections featuring the entire ensemble with solo passages, obviously featuring the soloist or group of soloists. And then the other form is sonata form. From sonata form, classical concerto pulls the large sections, exposition, development, and recapitulation. It also pulls the thematic divisions within those sections. So we still expect to get primary theme, transition, secondary theme, and closing theme. Additionally, sonata form provides the basic harmonic framework. One thing that's different between classical concerto form and sonata form, though, has to do with the number of expositions. In classical concerto form, there are actually usually two expositions. They differ in two ways. So the first exposition features the orchestra and typically does not modulate, or at the very least, it'll end in tonic. The second exposition, in contrast, features the soloist and modulates as expected. So if you're dealing with a major mode concerto, the second exposition will modulate from tonic to dominant. If you're dealing with a minor mode concerto, the second exposition will modulate from that minor tonic to the relative major, the mediant key. So in other words, the two expositions differ in two main ways. The first has orchestration, so whether you're featuring the large ensemble or if you're primarily featuring the soloist. And the second differentiation has to do with key. Exposition one will stay in tonic more or less, and exposition two will modulate as we would expect a typical exposition to do. Both expositions, both the first and the second one, will still usually contain an MC. As usual, that MC will serve as the divider between the first half of the exposition and the second half of the exposition, in other words, between the end of TR and the beginning of S. And both expositions will still have a perfect authentic cadence that concludes us. So we'll call both of those an EEC. The, in the first exposition, the EEC is a little bit of a misnomer just because we haven't actually modulated, so there's no secondary key to confirm. But go ahead and mark it as the quote-unquote scare quotes EEC anyway, just so we can understand that that still is a significant arrival point as marking the end of us. Sometimes the expositions will differ in details of the content. So, for instance, the soloist will often augment or overwrite passages from the orchestral exposition. What I mean by that is the soloist could, say, start with a slightly different primary theme and then tack on the one that the orchestra had introduced, or the soloist could start with the original material from the transition from Expo 1, but then add additional transitional material that's unique to Expo 2. Any sort of addition or truncation or substitution can happen in any thematic zone, so either in P, T, R, S, or C, or some combination thereof. One particularly frequent addition is called a display episode, or DE for short. It's a virtuosic passage that features a soloist, typically following S. It's one way to generate energy and excitement and drive towards the end of that second exposition, and it really gives the soloist a chance to shine. This is particularly common in piano concertos, though you can find it in some other concertos as well. Interestingly, the recapitulation often combines aspects of both expositions, not necessarily tracking exactly with either. Classical concertos are fascinating when they get to the recap because you're not entirely sure, is this going to be more like the first exposition? Is this going to be more like the second exposition? If they're going to be melded together, how are they going to be melded together? So there's a lot more variables in concerto form than just your straight up sonata form for a solo instrument, for example. So the bottom of the page basically puts most of this information into picture form. The sonata elements are clear. Expo 1, Expo 2, development, recap. The Baroque concerto influence comes from the alternations of ritornello sections, which means that features primarily the orchestra, with solo sections that, of course, features primarily the soloist. Now, it doesn't mean that the entire exposition two is going to have the soloist playing something in every single measure. There will often be short gaps where the soloist is tacit for a few measures just to provide a little bit of breather space. However, that soloist will still be the dominant voice throughout most of that section. As you can see, Expo 1 is typically featured just the orchestra. Expo 2 typically features the soloist. Interestingly, after the second exposition closes, there's the second ritornello that follows that, but usually precedes the development. 
This ritornello will feature the orchestra, but the thematic content varies from one piece to another. One thing that's particularly common is for the ritornello to include the closing theme or bring back some aspect of transition, though really any thematic zone can be coded in this area. Another thing I should draw your attention to in Exposition 2 is that the display episode is optional. Not all concertos have a display episode. And another thing that's kind of interesting is that sometimes the second exposition will simply end with S, so we don't have to get a closing theme in the second exposition. Anyway, Ritornello 2 will feature the orchestra. It will usually still maintain that secondary key, whatever it was. In this case, this example chart gives the common key areas for a major mode concerto form. At the development, as with most developments, there's a number of things that can happen. Oftentimes the development will quote a few themes from the expositions, but often not all of them. Occasionally new material will be introduced in the development, though again, that's not a strict requirement. The development usually primarily features the soloist, but given the fragmentary nature of a development, there's often a little bit more back and forth between soloist and orchestra than in some of the other sections. After the development closes, we get the recapitulation. Some recapitulations start with the primary thing being played just by the orchestra, so some recaps have this nod to a third ritornello at the beginning before the soloist re-enters a little bit later in the recapitulation. Some, in contrast, just start with the soloist playing right at the beginning of the primary theme. So the status of a ritornello, whether it happens at the beginning of a recapitulation or sometimes at the end of a development, varies from piece to piece. And then in some pieces, just skip over the third ritornello entirely and just feature the soloist both at the end of the development and at the beginning of the recapitulation. In any event, like any recapitulation, this section's job is to confirm the tonic key. So we'll get some version of primary theme. It might be more like Expo 1 or like Expo 2 or combine them, but we'll get some nod to the primary theme, some version of a transition. The secondary theme, as expected, will return in tonic, not in the subordinate key as it would have been in Exposition 2. If there's a display episode, it will often come back at this point. Closing theme sometimes comes back, sometimes does not. It depends on the particular piece. This is where, if this had just been a straight up sonata form, the piece would have ended. But because of the influence from the Baroque concerto, the piece continues a little bit further. So after the soloist has been featured for quite a while, the soloist typically drops out and you'll, we'll have a fourth ritornello. This ritornello is usually bifurcated by a cadenza. And essentially what will happen is the orchestra will play for a little bit, arrive on a cadential 6-4, and just stop. And then the soloist picks up by itself. Cadenzas originally were improvised, though a lot of performers these days tend to write them out and memorize them. But in any event, the cadenza will often allude to earlier themes in the piece. Often the quality of the cadenza would be judged based on how sophisticated the allusions were and how cohesive the cadenza was. The cadenza typically ends with the soloist trilling on scale degree two, which is the signal to the conductor and the orchestra to end and usually that chord underneath that trill for scale degree two is some sort of five chord, either a tried or a seventh chord. And then at the resolution of the trill, both the soloist and the orchestra will arrive on tonic for the start of the second half of Ritornello IV. That's usually the last that you hear of the soloist. The orchestra will continue and finish out the piece with select themes, most often the closing theme. So especially if the recap didn't have the closing theme, often that closing theme will be moved to the fourth ritornello and the orchestra will close out that theme. So this is a snapshot of classical concerto form. The vast majority of Mozart's concertos follow some version of this. The same is true of Beethoven. It really originated as early as J.C. Bach. That's who heavily influenced Mozart's composition, actually. You find traces of classical concerto form into the Romantic era as well. It depends on the particular composer. Some pieces and some composers prefer to go back to the single exposition model rather than having a double exposition as 18th century classical concerto forms did. But you can still find some pieces that have two expositions as well.